welcome to the seventh in the lecture series of, for an introduction to proof course that, uh, that goes in parallel with the textbook, A General Introduction to the Art of Mathematics. Uh, today we're going to be covering 1.7 in the book, which is about relations. So the, the layout of the talk will go something like this. We'll just have some introductory mark, remarks about relations in general, and then we'll particularly dive into binary relations. Towards the end, we'll, well, we'll mention a couple of uh, sets that are important when studying relations. And finally, we'll, we'll do a, an example or two of uh, ternary and higher order relations. Okay. So the first slide is titled Functional Relationships. Um, and there's many, many examples. I don't know why I picked the one I did, but um, energy for a moving object and its speed really the velocity uh, you know the use of the variable v makes you think velocity but it's really just how fast the thing is going is the um, it's related by the equation e equals mv squared if you've got a fixed amount of mass then you'd say look i've got a functional relationship between the velocity and the energy and in fact this is a I feel like a little bit of a public service announcement here. This is an important functional relationship because if you're going twice as fast, you have four times as much energy. That's what the, the squaring on V does for you, which is um, very applicable to driving cars. If you're, if you're prone to driving too fast, think about this, that because of the squaring of velocity, high speeds involve much higher energies than low speeds. So, well, you know what a parabola looks like. So if the energy goes up like a parabola compared to the velocity or speed just changing linearly. Okay. That's why going, you know, 90 gets people killed, whereas going 60, most people survive accidents. Well, okay, so the real point today was to talk about the word relation or the concept of a relation. And we use that term when there's a relationship but it's not functional, or it could be, right? It could be a functional thing, but it needn't be. Um, relations, this is a, a, a really a kind of a key point. Relations are Boolean. If you put a relation down on a piece of paper, you're either claiming something is true or something is false. Um, that's, that's sort of, What's, what it says here on the slide is actually the most accurate thing. If you provide inputs to a relation, if you put particular values of the inputs, you either get true or false. Um, at first, we usually think of relations as being between two things. I mean, like, I think my favorite example is x less than y. That's a relation. The less than sign is actually the relation the x and y are the inputs. Uh, but anyway, there, there are the options. You can have three things. You can have multiple things. But when there are two things, that's known as a binary relation. So yeah, my favorite example again, x is less than y. What does the graph of x less than y look like? I think that's something you've done in high school, maybe. Um, so let's take a look at a Desmos window to, uh, to examine that. When you do this by hand, you usually say, well, the boundary condition is what y and x are equal, right? And then you have to figure out what side of the line to shade. To shade. But in Desmos, um, you can actually just type x less than y, and it does the right thing for you, which is kind of nice, although maybe there's a shortcoming that it, it'd be nice if it didn't take care of all the work for us. You know, it's good mental exercise to, to figure these things out. But that's how the graph looks. The graph of x less than y is the stuff that's shaded here on the screen. Um, the line y equals x is shown dashed because that's not part of the set. So when you have a, a region, you use a, a dashed line on its boundary to in indicate that the boundary is not part of it. But rather like the open parenthesis used on an interval to say that that endpoint's not in it. All right, so that's what the graph looks like. Um, I'm going to come back to this, so let me hang, let it hang around. But um, what have I said here? 
equivalence to, I have used bad grammar is what I've done, but equivalence to a set of ordered pairs. The idea here is simple. The relation is the less than sign, right? But you could define the relation by saying, here's the things that are in it. Much like you can define a set by saying roster form, I'll write everything down. Well, to define the less than relation, you could say it's all those, it's all those points that you see. They're in the relation. What points are not in the relation? Those are the ones out here that are uh, not shaded. Now, admittedly, this is um, this is a little hard to, th to imagine as literally listing them because there's so many points there, infinitely many points. But um, the real point, not to be silly about it, but the point here is that you can just identify the relation with its graph. The graph is the relation. And, and that's actually something that we do frequently. In fact, this, this is the best way to define an arbitrary relation. It's an arbitrary graph. Yeah, the graph literally is the relation. OK, so um, if you have a given relation, for example, the one we just used, x less than y, there is another relation that gives exactly the opposite answer. Right? If x is less than y, then it says false. If x isn't less than y, it says true. You know what that is? It takes exactly the opposite truth values of the less than sign. You probably do know what this is. That's the greater than or equal to sign. Notice it's greater than or equal to, not just greater than. Um, what would the graph of that look like? If we return to Desmos. Um, like the other one, you can literally uh, just type that in. X, you type uh, greater than and equal one after the other, and it converts it to the equal sign. X squared equal to Y. You get that. Now, if I turn off the, the red one, that's the greater than or equal to thing, and it includes the boundary. So the line y equals x is in this set. It's not in the other one. The two of them together, you'll notice their union would be the entire plane. Every point's in one thing or the other, which is, is really what the, the negation of a relation is about. It's the, in fact, it's the complement of it as a set. So, oh, well, I just did that. We compared their graphs. In this last slide that we just looked at, we, we saw that relations naturally come in pairs. Um, more to the point, there is a, a, a notion of taking the negation of a relation. And, and, but it's true that the, a, a relation and its negation form a natural pairing. So, for example, the ones we just looked at, less than and greater than or equal. Um, what other relations do we know? And then what are their corresponding negations? Question. Um, the issue here is to think about the sorts of symbols that you can introduce between two numbers, and then you'll get something that's true or false. Um, that kind of notion, that notation where the, the symbol appears in between the inputs is known as infix notation. There is occasionally, there are occasionally prefix and even postfix notation for, for relations, but infix is the most common. Um, and here's a couple that we know. Oh, let's look at these. The equal sign, do you think of that as a relation? It is certainly a symbol that you stick in between two numbers and you either get true or false though, right? I already mentioned less than, greater than, of course, the opposite number, less than or equal, greater than or equal. And this vertical bar, the divide sign, right? That's something you can stick in between two integers in the case of a division symbol and you will get true or false. What are the, how, how do the negations of these work? What's the negation of equals? There actually is a not equal sign. A, a, a lot of times in programming languages, you'll use less than, greater than. You'll stick the two uh, symbols right next to each other to mean not equal. Um, or another common variant is to put an exclamation part in an equal, which to me looks like I'm excited that they're equal, but no, it's 
saying not equal. Anyway, uh, we saw less than's negation is greater than or equal, and greater than's negation is less than or equal. So the the arrow, the directions of the symbols will turn around, and the uh, you get the equal sign on the arrow. What about the negation of the divisibility relation? Do you know what that would be? There's I should probably draw this for you. There's a there is a way to denote it. Most often, when we have something like an an equal sign, for instance, to say not equals, you just draw a slash through it. But the the problem with that is the vertical bar for divisibility is is vertical. <laughs> and if you draw a slash through it, you end up with something that's almost in line with it. So the slash is usually just a a little bit less steep and and kind of crosswise on the on the not division symbol. Okay. So let's talk next about some sets that are related to uh, relations. I didn't mean that to be a joke or, or to be wry or anything, but they're related and these things are relations. It's kind of funny. Uh, some relations, the element sign, that triple, that funky E looking thing is a nice example. That's a relation, right? It's a symbol that goes in between two things. And you either get, yeah, it is an element, or no, it's not an element. Um, but that one's weird because you've got entirely different sorts of critters on either side of it, right? You have maybe a number, of, like root 2 on the left, and you have a set, like, for instance, rational numbers on the right. And, well, that one, root 2 in Q, would be false. But, like, two-thirds in Q, that would be true. Different sorts of things on left and right. So the set of things that appear on the left of a relation symbol is called the domain of that relation. You've, you've heard this word before, right? The domain of a function. I know you've talked about that lots. Um, it's the same idea, really. It really is the, the inputs, the x's that may appear, or that do appear, rather, in the function. Here's another set, a set of things that may appear on the right of a relation symbol. It's called the codomain of the relation. Now, I'll just talk about notation here or mention the notation. The relation, for some reason, people often use the letter R, a capital R. This is a this is particularly in a, a special font that's called sans serif. It has no serifs on the no decorations on the letters. So a sans serif R is often used for a, a relation where we don't know what it is yet. So we'll say dom of R for domain of R and cod of R for codomain of R. Um, yeah, bonus points. Did anybody notice the one word difference between the descriptions of domain and codomain? I kind of screwed up and partly gave that away at, at one point, but I, I decided to keep flying, see if you guys would notice it. Anybody? Whoops. <laughs> Can't do that and go backwards. Uh, let me point it out. The domain, it just says the things that appear on the left. When we talked about code domain, it says the set of things that may appear on the left. There's the difference. The one word may. How is that making a difference? Well, um, it's tied to face something that's sort of a, a bad thing, I think. That, that there's an inherent asymmetry in the way mathematicians speak about the sets that are related to relations. The, um, the things on the right-hand side of the relation, you have two different things. You have the codomain, things that might appear on the right-hand side, and another set, which I believe you heard about this when you did functions too, the range. So the range of a relation is the set of things which actually appear, the things that are the right-hand coordinates and points that are in the relation. Where, where's the asymmetry? On the left-hand side, we don't make a distinction between the things that potentially could be there on the left and the things that actually do. The domain consists of the things that literally appear as left-hand coordinates in the in the elements of a or in the points in a relation. So let's talk about arbitrary relations for a bit. Um, it's simple. It's a, an arbitrary set of points in the plane. That's a relation. It's we're defining a relation by what points are in that relation. And 
the domain and range consist of real numbers because we're talking about, in both cases, they're subsets of, on the one hand, the x-axis, and on the other hand, the y-axis. But, you know, in the ordinary way we think of the, the plane, both axes are real numbers, the sets of real numbers. So uh, one quick consequence of that is every function is a relation. Um, I like to always remember the example of all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares, right? That's where we're dealing with a similar thing. All functions are relations, but not all relations are functions. In fact, a function is a very special type of relation. It's a relation that passes the vertical line test. Um, Often we, we look at the inverses, inverse of a function, and you know that's got by just sort of flipping the graph around the line y equals x. Um, even when those things fail the vertical line test, which happens, those are relations. So, so let me give you an example of that in Desmos. If I had the, the function y equals x to the third minus x. Well, I've turned it off for some reason. That looks like this. Now, if I want the inverse of that, ordinarily it's a good bit of work, but in Desmos, it's really quite simple. And in fact, conceptually, it's just as simple too. The inverse is got by interchanging the rules of x and y. So just type uh, x equals that same formula, but with y's in it, y to the third minus y. And, well, that's freaky looking, but that's exactly a function in red. Just give me a second. I just want to put it in projector mode so those show up a little better. The, the function is in red. Its inverse is in green. And do you see the symmetry around the line y equals x? It's nice to add that in there as well. Although maybe Sorry, maybe I'll change the style on y equals x to be something like that. So, yeah, that looks horrible. Well, anyway, yeah, it's the mirror. The red graph mirrored across the, the dotted purple graph is, is the green graph. Uh, let's go ahead and get that out of the way so that we can just look at the graphs. The, the red graph, I, I expect everybody here knows the vertical line test. You, Imagine vertical lines dropping in like rain or hail coming in from above, and they're going to hit the graph once. But this guy, there's places particularly, well, look at the y-axis itself. There's a vertical line that hits this graph three times. So that's not a function, but both of them are relations. All right, let's, uh, let's return back to the slides. Um, we're actually free to define literally any subset of the plane whatsoever and say that's a relation or its, its contents are in a relation. So we get to make up our own relations. It becomes a Boolean thing. Uh, the question is, does that x, y coordinate pair uh, lie in the plane region that we're talking about? There are, on the other hand, there are plenty of examples where <clears throat> this sort of graphical approach isn't the best idea. So let's look at the, that's supposed to be like quotes around the divides uh, symbol, quotes around the, so let's look at the divides relationship on the set two up to 12. Why did I choose two up to 12? Because if I'd included one up to 12, <coughs> excuse me, I would have to write down all the things that look like one and something else. Everybody is divisible by one. So I just dropped one for that reason. If you think about that as a graph, you're just going to get a, a bunch of points scattered all over the plane. Um, it is informative, but you know you really get the same content, and maybe it's in a, bit, a way that's sort of easier to see things by just listing everybody. So it looks like that. Um, I arranged this is really a set of x y pairs. I arranged it. You, you notice the, the set brace at the beginning and end, uh, but I did arrange it in a quasi-logical way. The first row is the things that have two dividing into some other number, which is even. The second row is the things that three is dividing into some number, and four, or five, and six, and so on. Um, notice that in 
every row that we've got here, that I've talked about so far anyway, we have a number divides itself. Two divides two, three divides three. That's how we would read those pairs. Four divides four, five divides five, etc. So we also have to have seven divides seven, eight divides eight, nine divides nine, etc. We've got to have all those things. But we have sort of run out of the interesting ones. Right? There is no number between 2 and 12 that 7 goes into other than itself. Same for 8 or up to the rest of them. So, well, I think we can learn something often by, by listing and then thinking carefully about the, the contents of a relation. How about these questions? What, are, what is the domain? What is the range? What is the codomain? Well, the domain here is literally 2 through 12. It's, it's the set that I referred to up at the top. Do you see why? We need to look at all the x coordinates that literally appear. And there's a 2, there's a 3. These are both happening in the, in the left hand side of the pairs that are in 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So there's the domain. What about the range? Well, that's the y coordinates. And because of these ones that always look like a, a, a pair, a, a number dividing itself, the same y coordinates are going to appear as right hand sides as appeared as left hand sides. So it's also 2 through 12. What about codomain? There we could actually throw a, a, a monkey wrench into the works. We could say, well, natural numbers or integers for the codomain. There's, it's any set that contains the outputs. So it's a set where the outputs may appear. Um, and so in any particular situation, we're going to have a codomain in mind. And then often the, the real task at hand is to, knowing that the codomain is, say, naturals, figure out what the range actually is, what, as opposed to what things might appear in the Y slot, what things actually do appear in the Y coordinate. How about this? What's the negation of that relation? Hmm, well, it won't have any of the pairs x, x, the, the things like 2, 2. But there will be certain things that start with a 2. 2 with 3, 2 with 5, 2 with 7. It's the things where 2 doesn't divide into that number. So 2 with any odd number. What things will be in, in there that have a 3 in the negation, but have a 3 in the, in the x coordinate? 3 and 4, 3 and 5, but not 3 and 6. They're sort of, you can imagine inserting them in, the, in between these things. 3, 6, then 3, 9. Well, in between those would lie 3, 7, and 3, 8. They're in the Compton uh, negation. I think I don't need, need to belabor that point too much. Um, there are a lot of things in the negation that don't even make sense in the divisibility thing, like um, 2, comma 7. What about 7, comma 2? I would never ask about that because seven is bigger than two, but seven comma two would be an element that has a seven in the first slot and something that seven doesn't divide in the second slot. So for each of these things on the last row, you get a boatload of things in the negation of the thing, everything except for uh, the number in itself. The number and anything else will be in the negation. That's probably more stuff that I want to write down, so I didn't. Okay. Other examples, um, again, going back to the things that are in, well, that can be um, visualized, that can be seen as parts, sets of the plane. You could define a relation R by, and R again, this is the arbitrary relation. Notice how I'm putting the R in between X and Y. That's that infix notation I mentioned. And anyway, we've actually seen this double bar, double headed uh, arrow thing before too. It means exactly when. Or, if and only if. So x will be related to y if and only if x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 1. I don't know when I would need that particular relation, but I could. I could certainly define it. This is one of the beauties of, of math. I think a lot of people don't recognize that um, you're, you're always allowed to name something that you need. If, you're, if there's something that in your particular problem would be handy to have a, an expression for, a name for, do it. Um, 
More than once I've heard people say the most important word in mathematics has three letters and it's let. Because that's what you do when you want to name a, a relation. I would, I would actually say let R be defined by X, R, Y equals or X and R, Y, if and only if X squared plus Y squared less than or equal to one. So as a set, what is that? Um, this is the boundary and the interior of the unit circle. Can I get Desmos to help us with that? Sure, I bet you. Let's get this stuff out of here. Let's do a new one. Uh, we wanted, it's, it's strange to me that Des, Desmos can deal so well with things that are not solved for the variable. I'm so used to the graphing calculator where you had to have it y equals something. And Desmos doesn't care. It just says, yeah, I'll, I'll graph that for you. There it is. X squared plus Y squared less than or equal to one. I guess I should zoom in on it a little. It's it's the boundary as we see there's a solid line around it and the interior, that's what's shaded, uh, of the unit circle. Uh, often, oh, this is a good point. Often we'll create sort of unusual relations by combining the more basic sets. For instance, can you imagine what uh, what this compound inequality looks like? It's y in between x minus 1 and x plus 1. Come here, Desmos. Let's try that one, yeah. What was it again? I had y in the middle, less than or equal x plus 1 on the right, and I think it was this way, x minus 1 on the left. It was less than there. Or did I do it wrong? The less than or equal was on the left side, so. And this one needs to be just strict less than. There we go. Did it work? Yeah. Is that, I mean, is that an arbitrary set in the plane? Sure. It, it's a little bit hard to describe, I guess. It's, it's the region in between the two lines y equals uh, x plus 1 and y equals x minus 1. The lower one is x minus 1, the higher one is x plus 1. Not including the points that happen to lie on the upper of those two lines, but including the ones that are, yeah. But, you know, we could we could define such a relation and, and then we could get to use r in place of this more complicated algebra. So just pointing out that compound inequalities are true or they're false, right? Either y lies in that range between x's uh, pre predecessor and its successor, or it doesn't. All right, we're going to wrap up with a quick exploration of some relations that are a bit more complicated. So ternary relations. That's when you have three things that are in some relation to one another. And in that case, you can think about um, the relation being a subset of three-dimensional space. Think of it as an X, Y, Z coordinate system. Then you've got some of the points are in the relation and some of them are not. Uh, an example of that might be the relation that, and, and I can say this quite succinctly, X, Y, and Z appear in order, right? They're, they're in the natural order. So X is smaller than Y and Y is smaller than Z. And by the way, did you notice that the way I spoke that was I used the word and in between them? X is less than Y and Y is less than Z. I'm basically taking two bi ternary, excuse me, two binary relations and glomming them together with an and right, to kind of create a ternary relation. That's not how, how all uh, ternary relations get created, but it is a way to make one. Now that could be quite difficult to visualize, right? Um, let me let me point out that it's not impossible, but it's it's hard. So let me make a change to this so that we have x less than y. And I don't need that other less than sign. If x is not smaller than y, then that that ternary relation where we're looking at is broken. So you could think about there's a part of the plane above which we'll see points that are in the relation. If you're down here in this bottom part that's all white, you're not going to see any points above you that are in the relation. But if you're standing over here in the gray, then you can look up and see things that are in the relation. 
and they are things where the z coordinate exceeds the y coordinate and that turns out to be sort of a slanted roof it's it's where yeah it's covering this this gray area that we're seeing now but then there's a plane at an angle coming up in the z direction and then things above that plane are in the relations so it, it you can with practice learn to visualize things in 3d but you know, it's going to be tough and often it's not really that necessary um yeah because we'll use the definition of the thing right we won't really need you don't need to necessarily appeal to your visual uh intuition you can just use the definition here's a, a, a slightly different relation although it also involves three things it's called betweenness if you go into study geometry from an abstract point of view, not like the Euclidean geometry, but um, whether well, there are extensions of Euclidean geometry and, and a famous man named David Hilbert came up with a way to axiomatize those sorts of geometries. Um, and one of the things he needed for that was between this relations. So this applies to triples of points that lie on a line. And you write it this way, A star, B star, C. So that, that's because you got three things. There's no longer one symbol goes between them because there's no, it's actually the issue of between us. There's not a spot that's in between these three things. There's, there's three things. And anyway, the, um, so, the, so that's the notation for it. Um, if you do this, if or you write this, if B happens to lie, as it sounds, in between A and C, it's on the segment that's determined by A and C. It's on the open segment is the way I think that is usually defined where is that is B is not equal to A and it's not equal to C, but it is on that line segment in between them, the open interval from A to C, if you're coordinatizing the, the line. <clears throat> you should notice that A and C behave symmetrically in the between us relations, because if you had C and, and if you interchange the roles of A and C, if you just swap the points, you'd still have a, a true between us situation if B lay in between them. So ABC is true, then CBA is true, and vice versa. Uh, if you have a geometrical diagram with not too many points on it, um, there's only so many possible triples of points that can satisfy between us, and you can just write them down. Um, I, think I'll, I think I'll, actually, before we proceed, I think I'll actually do that for a, just a simple situation. Let's, let's bring this up so we can see it better. All right, so suppose my diagram has four points on it. A, B, C, and D. Okay. And I want to write down all the between this relations that are true. So you see that A, B, C is is in the between this relation because B lies in between A and C. But um, also ABD is in that relation. So A star B star D is in there because B is lying in between A and D. What else? Well, uh, C lies between A and D. So we have that. That would be A star C star D, and I think there's one more. Yeah, so notice how all of these involve A. There's another ternary relation that's true on, in this little geometry, that uh, B star C star D is true. C lies in between B and D. Now there are others that are true, but they are just reversals of these. So CBA, DBA, I should point to them while I talk. C, B, A, D, B, A, D, C, A, and D, C, B. Those would all be, also be in the relation. But again, since we know that the reversals are going to be in the relation, it's often the case that you just write down one. Okay, we're going to now see our last example of a relation. This one's hairy. <laughs> it's a little bit strange. Um, the problem is for this relation that we're going to be in four dimensional space. It's a, a quaternary relation. Um, the 
remember when we were talking about the rational numbers, we, we got into this quandary about, you know, how do you tell that two thirds and four sixths are actually the same rational number? How do you know when two expressions involving uh, fractions of naturals actually, yeah. I think I, I believe I just misspoke that I said rational number or natural number. Well, anyway, we're trying to say when two fractions give you the same rational number, but the contents of the fractions are natural numbers. When is AB equal to A over B equal to C over D? Oh, okay, I jumped the gun here. That, that's going to be a subset of four-dimensional space. So there are actually tricks to learn how to visualize things in 4D, but I don't think we'll have much luck visualizing this relationship in 4D. All right, so now here's where I was trying to get to. Two fractions, A over B and C over D, are equal when AD equals BC. All I've done there is cross multiply. It doesn't look like cross multiplying when you have the, the version of the fraction bars that I've got there. What's happened to my drawing pad? Oh, there it is. Uh, but if you write your fractions upright, if A over B is equal to C over D, then when you cross multiply, the B, the D goes up to there, the B goes over to here, it's AD equals BC. That looks more like cross multiplication for real, right? All right, so here's the relation we're after. I'm going to call it R. Again, that's that sans serif R. What it is, it consists of four tuples. So X, Y, Z, and W that are in R4. Actually, I could probably have talked about N4, but I wanted you to think about graphs, you know, um, because the first thing I do after that is say, well, X, Y, Z, and W are all natural numbers. So instead of all of R4, we're looking at just the points with natural number coordinates. Um, I could even have done z here, the integer coordinates. And the defining property is that xy equals yz. Now, that's a relation on r. And if we do the right thing with that relation, we actually come up with what ultimately is the, the best definition for the rational numbers. But that's that's for a little, little bit off in the future. I think for today, we've hit the end of the trail. So uh, thanks for your attention, and uh, have a good rest of your day.